This simulation has been prepared to explain how a multi-piece rim is assembled, how dual wheels are mounted, and the possible sequence of events when the wheel assembly blew apart and fatally injured Mr. S. Davis. The truck was on its seventh load of the shift when Mr. S. Davis informed Mr. C. Davis that he was taking truck 46 to the workshop to replace a doughy or soft wheel. The truck was driven with two trailers attached. A third was added and the truck parked in the workshop for tyre repair alongside a water tanker. Truck 46 is a Kenworth C510, shown here without the trailers for clarity. One of the left hand rear dual tyres was to be replaced. The figure in the simulation is life size and shown next to the rear left hand dual wheels. There are two wheels fitted to each side of the drive axle. The tyres are for a 25 inch diameter rim and are used without an inner tube. The rim is the Rim-X 25 inch rim. This section is the rim base. A spacer band is fitted to separate the inner and outer rims. The bead seat band sits between the rim base and the tyre. The o-ring is a circular piece of rubber. It seals the air between the bead seat band and the rim base. Flanges support the tyre sidewalls. A lock ring is fitted as a key to hold the other components in place on the rim. The wedge band distributes the clamping force to hold the rim in place on the hub. The hub is the driving part of the axle that holds the wheels. Stud, clamp and nut hold the rim and tyre assembly onto the hub. The clamp acts like a lever. One end rests against the hub and the other pushes on the wedge band when the nut is tightened. What you are seeing is the assembly of the components onto the rim base. First, the inner wheel is shown, followed by the mirror image assembly of the outer wheel. The o-ring is fitted onto the rim base, followed by a side wall flange, the tyre and the other flange. The bead seat band sitting between the flange and the o-ring and finally all components are keyed in place by the lock ring. A set of jewels is put together by fitting the inner wheel assembly onto the hub. Followed by a spacer band and then the outer wheel assembly. A wedge band is located against the outer wheel. Each of the 12 cleats and nuts are then fitted. The nuts are torqued to a stated manufacturer's specification. This is a close-up view of a cleat and nut on a stud, showing how the clamping force is achieved. The location of the crack in the rim base is now shown. 
The lock ring fits into the lock ring groove in the rim base. The crack in the rim occurred at this point and caused the rim to completely separate into two pieces at the bottom of the lock ring groove. The possible sequence of events is now shown. Mr. S. Davis loosened all of the nuts using a rattle gun. Nuts and cleats were removed from positions 1 and 9. The crack in the rim base is shown opening in slow motion. The broken gutter section of the rim base, lock ring and wedge band are forced into the loosened cleats, shearing six of the studs and bending the remaining four out of the way. The wedge band peels out from between the hub and the wheel followed rapidly by the outer assembly, spacer band, lock ring, broken rim base, and finally the deflated inner tyre. This is shown again a little quicker. Numbering the studs from the tyre inflation stem, clockwise. The numbering sequence shown here is consistent with the investigating officer's report. Number one, the nut has been completely removed from the stud. Numbers two and three, the studs were sheared. Number four, the stud with clamp and nut fitted had been bent. Numbers 5 and 6, the studs were sheared. Numbers 7 and 8, the studs with clamp and nut fitted had been bent. Number 9, the nut had been completely removed from the stud. Number 10, the stud with clamp and nut fitted had been bent. The nut had almost been unscrewed from the stud. Numbers 11 and 12, the studs were sheared. The cause of the fatality was the pre-existing crack in the inner rim that was held in place by the clamping force of the cleats. Once Mr S Davis had released the clamping force, the ejection of the wheel assemblies was inevitable. There would have been no uncontrolled release of energy had the tyres been deflated before loosening the nuts. Mr S Davis would then have been in a safe position to remove the wheels as on many previous occasions.